Right, so this is lecture 30 of ECE 503. So in today's lecture, um, we're going to be changing course slightly. So, um, so as opposed to the last 29 lectures where we have been exhaustively talking about all of this deterministic stuff, we're going to take a different tact and we're now going to look at more the random phenomenon and how we use signal processing in order to do cool things like in lecture 31, uh, autoregressive and moving average and autoregressive moving average type of functions. So in order to understand the random world, we need to sort of be able to understand how to characterize them. All right? So what do I mean? So, okay, so we have this generic random process thing, right? But let's, let's, let's doodle. You know how much I love to sort of, um, you know, sort of reveal the punchline before telling the joke. That's why I'm a really poor joke teller. So to me, I, l I usually, when I talk to folks about viewing the world in terms of a variety of different random phenomenon, I usually like to tell folks to look at every sort of random event as a black box. Okay? And then this black box, okay, produces a value. Like, so when I prompt this, I said, okay, black box, give me a value. And what ends up happening, it says, here you go. Right? <laughs> so what happens is, yeah, in the real world, you don't say, okay, noise, what's the next value you're giving me? But this black box model sort of helps at least put into context a little bit about what we mean by a random event, a random variable. So what a random variable is, okay? So is, suppose we have this random variable. So this is my way of saying this is a capital X. So what happens is this capital X essentially is your black box. It is a variable. We don't know what it produces. And then at some point when we look at it, it says, here you go. And little x is that output of that black box, right? So what ends up happening is x can assume a range, sorry, a range of possible values. And one of them is equal to x, little x. So what ends up happening is uh, a random variable is when we have this big x, we don't know exactly the value that produces. When we observe it, it produces a little value x. Little value x is deterministic. It's like, you know, someone asked me, like, professor, give me an integer. Three, you know, I'm a random variable. I didn't even think about it until like, oh, three, I like three. Three is a nice number. So what ends up happening is this random variable conceptually could be anything within a specific range, and we'll talk about that range in a second, and it could really be anything, and, and we don't know what it is until we observe one of its outputs at a specific time instant. What's really cool is that we do not characterize the random variable by its exact value. We don't say, oh, um, x is equal to 3 all the time. Absolutely not. x is equal to something like some function or something. Absolutely not. x does not follow a deterministic function. x does not equal a deterministic number. x is random, totally random. This is one of the hardest points in ECE 502 random, um, you know, random variable, no, uh, probability and random processes. The problem is, is that we will, in a random process context, we will never know exactly, in advance, exactly what x is going to produce. On the other hand, we do have clues. So what do engineers do best? We observe, right? Sometimes way too much for our own good. Do you hear that noise? Is my house falling? What's that crack over there? 
you know? Everyone else is like, do 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 do. Oh, nice paint job. Oh, I love what you did with the place. No, the engineer is like, there's a problem. And you know, it's like, analyze, analyze, analyze. And you wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning, hyperventilating, because you think there's a problem at home. We do the same thing with random events. What happens is we look at X, we study it, we explore it. And then what happens is we may not know what the next value is going to be. Just like if you go to a casino, right? And you know, we sometimes, let's say even if you're not an engineer, people analyze, right? They're out there and they say, which, which one of the casino slot machines, the penny slots, is the lucky one, right? And then you see the person who just got like, you know, $500 from that penny slot. Do you go start playing on that one? No, <laughs> because that just paid out big time and the chances of it striking, you striking $500 after someone else struck $500, super bad. But we characterize the casino floor. There's that person there, putting penny after penny after penny. Nowadays, you have the stupid card, so it takes the romance out of putting pennies into the actual machine, just as much as that lever doesn't do anything. You know, everything's a button now. And so you look around, and it's like, where are people putting in lots of money not getting any reward? Oh, that one. Oh, leaping lemurs. Okay, I'll go with that. And you start putting, and then after a few minutes, you might have spent a few dollars, bing, 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 you know, noises and stuff, and you get $10. So you, you, you almost break even. So we do the same thing with random variables. What we do is we characterize them. And we characterize them to a distribution of the outputs, okay, being generated by it, being generated by it. Okay? So for instance, like we go back to this guy here, our black box model. What do we do? We observe it. So this is my really scary version of an eye. You know, eyebrows, right? Maybe crow's feet, you know, so it's an old person, probably me. And so what happens is our eye is observing. Every time a value x comes out of that black box x, we say, okay, now it's a 3. Now it's a 0.5. Now it's minus 1. Now it's a 2.9. And we notice a distribution. And we chart that distribution. We say, OK, this is little x produced by the random variable x, right? And we see, over time, like lots and lots and lots of observations, it looks like this. Okay? And say that this distribution, so we call this a density, right? f x of x. What happens is, let's say this, 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 we call this the probability density function. Let's say that it's, lo it's centered at 3, but it can assume values anyway, anywhere from minus infinity to plus infinity. So that bell curve, what it tells me is that most of the values that that black box x is going to produce will be at 3. But there is a non-zero probability that it can assume any value between minus infinity and plus infinity. But it's most likely, right, the density is highest here at around 3. And then we notice this sort of declining slope. So the height tells me with what probability. So there's a 0.3, so 30% chance that around 3, I'm going to get an output of that black box. And then it goes down and down and down, and until asymptotically it goes to zero at minus infinity and plus infinity. Okay? So that is how, so when we talk about probability, when we talk about random variables, what we talk about is the characterization of these random phenomena according to densities or distributions, essentially their characteristics, how they produce these observations, these values, randomly out of time. And then mathematicians and engineers and scientists notice that certain distributions seem to come up time and time again. This here is my lame attempt at drawing a Gaussian, right? It almost looks like Laplace, but it's Gaussian. No, take that back, it's not Laplace. Gauche. So what happens is, it, but it has that bell curve-like distribution. There are other distributions, right, like exponential random variables. So we usually talk about random variables as 
Gaussian random variables, so they produce characteristics that look like this. We talk about Laplace random variables. We talk about Cauchy random variables, Poisson random variables, um, exponential random variables, Rayleigh random variables, uh, Ricean ra like there are a variety of dis different di distributions out there, each with its own unique characteristic, right? And so what is the what is this? field of random processes and random variables. So what do we do with them? So what happens is this entire area of random variables and characterizing them, we take it one step further. If we understand the characteristic of the random variable, we can then, uh, you know, furthermore use it to sort of analyze and see with what probability a certain outcome will occur. So you probably are aware, if you have a density, right, so let's say we take this bell curve thing again, right? And so what is the probability that I, that random variable, x, is going to produce a value that is less than or equal to 4? So what is the probability that that will occur? So we go up to value 4, and we integrate the density all the way up to 4. And that what happens is we basically take every possible outcome up to four, like, you know, so every value, what is its probability, and we sum it up. So it's an infinitesimal sum from minus infinity to four, and that will tell us with what probability we'll get a value that's less than or equal to four. So that is random variables in a nutshell. Oh, wow. Imagine if I taught 502 like that, everybody's okay. Like, now we have 13 and a half lectures to talk about everything else. No, just kidding. So, if only, you know, I'm not sure. I, th I, I think whenever I hear this, I, I get kind of irritated when people say it. But I'm going to say it anyway. If only it were that simple. So what happens is life, oh my God, am I sounding ancient? So what happens is life is not just static random variables. What happens is, in, in reality, random phenomenon and its characterizations change over time. So that is a curveball to the random variable concept. So now what you've got, so let me erase this and redo everything, and now we throw in the factor of time. So now what happens, here's my black box, and now that, that, that the random variable x, its, the, its characteristics change over time. Its mean changes over time, perhaps. Its variance changes over time. Uh, whatever its distribution, you know, that physical, the, you know, the characteristic, that bell curve, right? This guy here, that guy might change. It might shift left or right. It might widen. It might compress, right? It might not even look like that anymore. And there are other higher order statistics that characterize it that might change over time as well. So this characterization may change. Okay, so warning. May change over time. Over time. I forgot what warning is again in German. It's like Verlach or something like that. I don't know. I think I've been reading too many labels lately. So in any case, <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll check out it after this lecture. I really now now I'm like it's nagging at me. Like, what is warning in German? But anyways, so what ends up happening is when we have a random variable whose characteristics change over time. We call that now a random process. Okay. So a random process essentially is when we have this, we have a random phenomenon, statistics change over time. And it, it's actually kind of interesting. So how do we how do we visualize this? So let's 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 um Let's, let's look at the, this cool diagram that I usually use in order to characterize how a random process works. Okay? So um, you probably have seen this. So first of all, we usually... So what, what do engineers do well, other than draw lima beans? 
Um, so what, what engineers do well is we take the physical world and we characterize it using mathematics. Right? That's what we do. Right? Even at the, uh, let's say, that casino floor. How do we characterize that that slot machine is going to be way luckier than that? Based on observation, even though I'm not prescribing a number to it, I'm giving it some sort of qualitative weight that that slot machine that hasn't paid out big yet will be more likely to pay out, at least when I play it, rather than that one which just gave out a large payout. But let's say we can characterize anything, any sort of event. And so what happens is we have a space, we call it omega. Oh, I love omega. And what happens is we have an event. Okay? And we call it little omega. So what ends up happening? So what, what do engineers do? So we first of all go back to the random variable thing. So what does the random variable, what's one part of that random variable um, step? What the random variable does is we take this qualitative phenomenon and we map it to a real number line. So what we do is that this guy here, so let's say this is real value, so let's say that's x. And what the random variable does is it's a mapping of some physical phenomenon to a real number, any real number, right? And then the probability that omega, let's call it omega 1, occurs, well, that's where that black box model comes up. Like, what is the probability that that value x will come up uh, through this mapping? How much more will that come up than, let's say, this a mapping of omega 2, omega 3, omega 4? So this mapping, this function, so your random variable is the mapping from the physical sort of space here, right? Omega over to the real line. Now, random process, an RP. What an RP is, is, it's a little bit more complicated. What it is, is it's x, it's omega, and it's t. And so the way it's going to look like, right, is the following. So what you've got is you have time, okay, and suppose you're mapping, so let's say this is the value, the numerical value of omega 1 over time. Omega 2, omega 3, okay? So what ends up happening is that your random process, okay, essentially across time and across these possible outcomes, right, the numerical representations of omega 1, omega 2, omega 3, this is what your random process, or at least this is one graphical representation of what an RP looks like. What's kind of interesting is what happens if I look at one specific time instant? What do I have? Random variable. How? So what happens is I have these three possible outputs of my black box X, right? It could either be this value, this value, or this value. I do not know which one my random process at t1 will produce. There will be a certain probability that omega 1, the value that corresponds to omega 1, will be outputted. Omega 2, there's a certain probability that that will be produced. And same thing with omega 3. We hold, let's say now, at time instant t2, my random process. And again, it now becomes a random variable. I don't know which one of the three will be produced. Now, what happens if I don't hold the time fixed, right, but I hold one of the omegas fixed? What do I have? Deterministic function. Who said that? 
what happens is any one of those omegas is a deterministic time function. So what happens is we hold fix for a specific time instant. We don't know which omega is being chosen. We hold fix one of the omegas. We got a deterministic time function. If we fix one of the omegas and one of the time instances, we got a point. And if we don't fix anything, we got ourselves a random process. All right? So in a nutshell, OK, I've just covered all of 502. Who's taking 502? So one, two, woo -hoo, raise, raise your hand high. OK. <laughs> I'm sorry. I know people are like, uh, migraines. So, oops, wrong lecture. So, going back to our slides, that's exactly what I've articulated here. So, so we can, first of all, we know that the random variable maps from this omega space, right? The sample space omega, it takes a point and then maps it to the real line. And then what happens is we can characterize the probability that the random variable will produce the value little x by some sort of probability density function, the PDF, not to be mistaken by the Adobe PDF, which is a type of file format. What happens is, just like my little diagram over there shows, what happens is the random variable is random. There's no way that we can predict exactly what will come out with 100% certainty, but we can characterize the possible outputs. And that's already a very powerful tool. So then, given that, what ends up happening is we can then, by many, 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 many observations, we can create that density function. Essentially, the characterization of that output of the black box and produce, in this case, a PDF. This one's a Gaussian. Because the more samples you produce, the less quantized it looks like, and it actually looks less like a... Um, I guess that would be like a Central American pyramid and more and more like a Gaussian, okay? A random process, on the other hand, looks like this mess here. So here, what happens is for every one of those omegas which we map, so x1 of t is essentially um, take omega1 and map it to the real line. That would be, let's say, the first point we map from the sample space to the real line x2 of t, the second point, x3 of t, the third point, and so on and so forth. We have these functions that go across time, but the randomness is selecting which line at every time instant. And so, just like what I've summarized at the bottom of slide three, what happens is a variable t and a variable omega gives us a random process. A variable t and a fixed omega gives us a time domain function. A fixed t and a variable omega gives us a random variable. And both fixed t and omega is a deterministic point. So now this is where the cool stuff comes in. OK, I have a very different definition of cool than you guys. But, but what happens is, I don't know. I'm hyper today. Sorry about that. So what happens is this is actually really important. So this is where we leverage the characterization properties. So first of all, um, how do we characterize a random process? So we're going to see this a lot. So um, we, like, remember a few lectures ago, we talked about we have a correlation function. And if we take the Fourier transform of the correlation function, we get the power spectral density. And then if we filter that power spectral density, um, if we take the magnitude squared of the transfer function of the filter and multiply by the input power spectral density, we get the output power spectral density. And if we take the inverse Fourier transform, we get the output correlation function, right? that also holds with random processes. In fact, it's super powerful. But in order to understand this, we've got to understand how to set these guys up. OK, so let's, let's do this. So what ends up happening, so we're going to use capital P to represent probability. We're going to ditch omega, little omega, just for simplicity of notation. And so when we have 
this guy. Okay, so what is the probability that my black box, x of t, produces a value less than or equal to x? What do we call this? So this, we're trying to find out what the probability that a random process at time instant t produces a value that's less than or equal to little x. What happens is this guy is equal to what? This is equal to something called the cumulative, cumulative distribution function. And I'll explain what that is in a minute. And that's going to be x and t. And so what, what do I mean by cumulative distribution function? So let's say we take the density, like that Gaussian we saw before, centered at 3. So if we have a value x here, what we're essentially doing is we're accumulating all the individual probabilities of every point up to and including that value x to give us this probability at that time instant. What happens is we can translate. So that's our PDF, right? Uh, yeah, x, t. And so we can write a function f, x, little x, t. And, and what we can do as a function of little x, we can draw something that looks like this. And this asymptotically goes to 1. So what this guy is, this is our, so this guy here is our PDF. And that's our CDF, cumulative distribution function. And what the CDF represents is as, like, you know, suppose we want to find out what is the CDF of x equals 5. For this time instant of t, this is the value. What that means is our black box x at that time instant t has this probability of producing a value anywhere from minus infinity up to that value x. For, and then as we slide x up or down, it will produce the probability that we will have a value of x from minus, uh, sorry, a value that the random process will produce between minus infinity and little x. So why is this important? Well, first of all, um, how do we get the PDF from the CDF? What happens is the, the CDF, uh, PDF from the CDF is going to be equal to the derivative with respect to x of the CDF. All right? And so what happens is, what happens when you take the derivative of the CDF? What are you doing? What happens when you take a derivative of any function? Slope. So what we're doing is slope, 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 slope slope, slope, slope. And what we're doing is we're, when we take all those derivatives, what we're getting is essentially this bell curve here. So the relationship between CDF and PDF is one of, the, like, you know, the slope of the CDF produces the PDF. The accumulation of the values at every given instant from minus infinity to that instant provides the CDF. All right? Now, that's kind of interesting, but what I'm really interested in, more importantly, is the relationship between two time instances of the same random process. So how do I mean? So let's go back to that messy tangle of functions, right? Right? So this is x of t, right? And so what happens, and that's t. So what I'm really interested in is what is the relationship, what is the joint CDF and the joint PDF at t1 and t2 of the same random process? That interests me a lot. OK? So what I'm really interested in is First of all, what is the relationship, the joint CDF and the joint PDF of that? And it's very, it's, it's, it's relatively straightforward. So what happens is, so we take these two points, and what our 
what, what it will translate into is essentially, so our joint CDF will look like this. So, so we're going to have um, essentially, like, well, actually, do I do a better job? Let's keep. Do I do a better job here? Uh, sort of. Okay, let, let's, let's go back to the diagram. I thought I did a better job there. So what happens is, suppose you have f of x, x1, um, x2, t1, t2. And so what this guy is going to be equal to is essentially what is the probability okay, that x at t1 is going to be less than x1 and x at t2 it's going to be less than or equal to x2. So it's a joint probability at these two different time instances of this random process and these two different values, x1 and x2. So that is our joint CDF. How do you get the joint CDF from the joint PDF? You take two derivatives, one with respect to x1, one with respect to x2. So to get f of x x1, x2, t1, t2, we would do second order dx1, dx2, f, x, x1, x2, t1, t2. So the derivative is respect to x1 and x2, and that would give us essentially a two-dimensional um, a two-dimensional distribution. Okay? for that t1 and t2, all right? And why do we care about this? Because what we're going to see is that there's some very interesting characteristics that we can look at with respect to random processes when we investigate how they behave with each other at two different time instances along the same process, OK? So given that, What ends up happening is we can do, we can formulate, like, you know, sort of these two time instances. In fact, we can actually form nth order distributions. We can go nuts, basically. We can, let's say, choose endpoints. So let's go back here. So suppose I want to do t3, t4. Let's say I have like n time instances and n x values. I can create an nth order joint CDF and joint PDF to characterize how all these different time instances interact with each other in the same random process. All right? So what we're going to look at is once we have this information, the next step is learning how to characterize it. So, you know, the simple characterization, so we have like PDFs and CDF. And this is that question in probability I always, I always ask. Uh, what sort of characteristics perfectly describe a random variable or random process? And the answer is it's PDF or it's CDF, hands down. The mean, no. The mean just gives you, OK, most of the uh, values are center around this point, right? The variance? Maybe it gives you a little bit more information, but 100% characterization is always the PDF and the CDF. So what I'm really interested in is, for instance, and we're going to be looking at this quite extensively, is how do two points on a ran random process correlate with each other? What I mean? So what I mean is, how does the information at one time instant in a random process, how much does its outcome affect an outcome at time t2 of the same random process? Right? So the autocorrelation means that auto signifies that we're looking at the same random process, and correlation means that we're taking two time instances on the random process, that same one, and we're saying, OK, dear, here are these two time instances. How much, how much correlation, how much information 
Um, how, how do these two time instances influence each other? And so that's what we call autocorrelation. And the way we calculate the autocorrelation between time instance T1 and T2 of random process X, we take the expectation, E, right, of X T1 omega and X T2 omega complex conjugate, in case it is a complex conjugate value, right? And how do you calculate the expectation? What it is, in this case, is you take x1, x2 complex conjugate, multiplied by the joint PDF at time instances t1 and t2, and you integrate, it's a double integral from minus infinity to infinity, uh, across x1 and across x2. This will give you the autocorrelation between these two time instances. The autocovariance co co is a little bit more interesting. We subtract off the mean. So the autocovariance is almost the same as the autocorrelation, except that in this case, we subtract off, so that should be a minus, we take the autocorrelation and we subtract off the mean function mxt1 and mxt2 uh, complex conjugate. Oh, I, I wanted to indicate our mean function when we do all these you know, autocovariance, autocorrelation, the mean functions, and we do these integrals and these expectations. So we have two variables here. We have t and we have x. We are doing this with respect to x, okay? t, t is, the time function's always there. This is going to vary always with time. It's always with respect to x that we do these operations, these uh, integrations and such. Correlation coefficient is just a sin single number so let's say you don't want a complicated function describing the relationship, the correlation, or the covariance, autocovariance of two time instances within the same random process. The correlation coefficient gives you a number that says, is this very correlated? Is this very anti-correlated? Is there any correlation? Is there zero correlation? This coefficient is a single number that ranges from minus one to one that says, is this really correlated or not? It's kind of like between 1 and 0, how correlated are you to x, y, z, right? And then I mentioned about autocovariance and autocorrelation. There's also something called cross-correlation and cross-covariance. So, cross -co so sometimes some folks might want to know how correlated are two time instances on two totally different random processes. So let's say I have random process X and random process Y, and I have time instant T1 and time instant T2. How correlated are these two guys on two different random processes? That's where the cross-correlation and cross-covariance comes in. All right. So to round off everything, why, so why am I belaboring this thing about the co covariance and the correlation and the autocorrelation and the cross-correlation and the like. The reason is we want to, there's one property, you know, so, the, like, you know, we go back to that crazy messy diagram. This guy here. So we go back to this guy here. Remember that I told you, as a function of time, the characteristic characteristics of this random process changes, right? The mean might change, right? Variance might change, like a variety of different properties might change from time instant to time instant to time instant. What I would like to do is can we characterize that random process across time, right? So what we do is there's something called a stationary process. So stationarity describes how the characteristics are related from one time instant to another to another to another across the entire random process. And there are several, several types. We're only going to talk about two in this class. So, and the first one is super idealistic. You seldom have this in real life. And that first one's called strict sense stationary. What does strict sense stationary mean? It means that the characteristics of the random process from one time instant to another to another to another don't change. Okay? 
So let me bring up the, the official definition. So it means a random process, x of t of omega, is strict sense stationary, or SSS, if its statistical properties are totally invariant to time shift. That means whatever its mean and whatever characterization, whatever its whatever whatever distribution it has from this time instant to the next time instant to a long time from now, it is invariant to the time shift. But not real this doesn't really happen much in life. This is the one that's kind of interesting a lot of people use, and it mostly characterizes a lot of what happens in the real world. It's something called wide sense stationary. And wide sense stationary means that if my random process is wide sense stationary, it, ha it must follow the following two. The mean function, that mx of t, is a constant. What that means is my mean from time instant to time instant to time instant across all time for that random process is a constant. And the other thing, the autocorrelation function between two points on the same random process is a function of the relative time separation between two points, not the absolute. So what do I mean by that? So let's go back to my random process diagram. Okay. So what this means is Let's say I have T1 and T2. And then let's say I have T1 prime and T2 prime. And T1 and T2 are separated by T. And T2, T1 prime, T2 prime are separated by T. What is the autocorrelation between T1 and T2 and T1 prime and T2 prime? They're identical. So wide sense stationary, what happens is your autocorrelation function depends only on the relative separation between two time instances, not their absolute value. Okay? So why is this all important? Because what happens is in DSP, if we design systems, if we design a filter, so here's h of n, and we feed in a random process x of t, and we output a random process y of t, I now have some very powerful tools. If I tell you that I have an LTI system, linear time invariant system, if, I, if x of t is wide sense stationary, mm, for now, let's use continuous time. So what happens is, if x of t is wide sense stationary, if I have a linear time invariant system, y of t is going to be wide sense stationary. And what I can tell you is if I know what the autocorrelation function is of x of t, its Fourier transform gives me the power spectral density. And then I know, so here's the relationship. Let me draw it. This is why it's so important. h of t, this guy is LTI x of t, this is a wide sense stationary random process. What's going to happen is x, y of t will also be wide sense stationary random process. What's also interesting is suppose that this guy, his autocorrelation is going to be equal to this. And in fact, what you're going to see is that if it's wide sense stationary, we sometimes write the autocorrelation function like this. So tau represents the time difference between t1 and t2. Let's take this one step further. Do we really need t1? No. So if you have a wide sense stationary random process, the autocorrelation, all you need to give is the relative separation in time between two points of it. Now, if I take the Fourier transform of this, this will give me the power spectral density, right? Now, if I take the magnitude of h of f squared times sxx of f, right, 
This will give me SYY of F. And then, now I have SYY of F. I take the inverse Fourier, Fourier transform, and this will give me RYY of tau. So what I've just done is I've created a really powerful tool. So the reason why I spent 40 minutes talking about random processes is because I want to get to the part where we can make wide sense stationary random processes. And if I know that I have an LTI system, I have an input random process that's wide sense stationary, my output will be wide sense stationary random process too, and that I can characterize its autocorrelation function based on the input autocorrelation function and the impulse response. It's beautiful. I think this, this totally is the walk away point, the, you know, the, the, the sort of key information that I want you guys to get out of lecture 30 is this guy here. I don't want to teach random processes and random variables. The key is this. On this slide here, um, the power of if you have a wide sensation or random process input, you have an LTI system, its output will be wide sense stationary, and the relationship between input and output is this, and we know that the Fourier transform and its inverse Fourier transform will produce a relationship between the power spectral density and the autocorrelation function. Okay? That's that in, a, in itself, like that's, that's huge. All right? All right. Okay. And so j on slide nine, that's exactly what I drew. And, and there's also something called the ergodic theorem. And so what the ergodic theorem describes is a method of computing the expectation of a random process using a single sample path over time. So what happens is we can either compute the mean, right, um, as a time function, right? So, so we, uh, every time instant, we can compute the mean of the random process. Or you can also use um, you know, a sampling path over time in order to compute its mean and the ergodic theorem shows that we can kind of relate the two, the, um, uh, you know, these, these uh, two kinds of averages, the ensemble average over outcomes and the time average. So I recommend all of you to read section 12.1.8 and 12.1.9 of your textbook. Okay? So with that, that concludes uh, lecture 30 of ECE 503. Okay.